You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from what I hope was a tasty lunch. I hope you're nicely energized for our afternoon sessions. We heard a lot about retail uh, this morning, and now we'll shift gears a bit with our first session this afternoon and hear from investment managers. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors. We couldn't do any of this without them. So I would like to introduce the sponsor of our next panel, uh, Michael O'Callaghan, Managing Director of Business Development at Wedbush Securities. Please join me in greeting Michael O'Callaghan to the stage. I, I mean, actually, I'm glad the music stopped because I was afraid I was going to have to start dancing or something. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Wedbush is actually going to be 70 years old next year. And originally, and for most of that time, Wedbush has been an equity-focused uh, firm. But in more recent years, uh, Wedbush has developed into a multi-asset clearing firm. And Wedbush Securities, Inc. is a combined broker-dealer and FCM uh, in the U.S. And I'm based in Chicago. I came to Wedbush by acquisition in 2014. So the, the multi-asset clearing angle is equities and equity options, fixed income clearing, futures clearing, and fixed income, or sorry, uh, foreign exchange is the most recent uh, addition to that clearing suite. And actually, the FX um, business was a business we picked up from Jeffries. And the moderator for the panel here this afternoon is Joe Lewis. And he's head of corporate hedging for Jeffries. And I'd like to introduce him. He's going to come on out here and bring the rest of the panel. And thank you very much for enjoy your time. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, just quick introduction, Joe Lewis. Uh, at Jefferies, I head up our corporate hedging and FX solutions business. I'm always saying at these things, I'm, I'm the fixed income guy in, that, in the room. But uh, what we have today, we have a pretty, really good panel. We, we've talked prior to this, and I think you guys will be really happy with what they have to share. I'll start at the end and have everyone introduce yourselves, and we'll, we'll switch it up a little bit from what, what I sent out as notes, uh, which was awesome. where you work, uh, what do you do there, and... Uh, not, I think I wrote why you love options, but I'm going to switch it a little bit and go sort of like what was like one of your early nicknames in the business. Early if you had, Nicknames. If you had one in the business. So huh. we'll start with Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, as one of the only women on the floor, I'm sure I had a lot of nicknames I cannot say out loud <laughs> on a microphone. Um, my name is Megan Morgan. I'm head of market structure at Belvedere. Um, I started my career out on the floor of the CME and the SIBO, and I had, um, my badge was Meg, M-E-G, um, and that is forever now my uh, nickname and the way I sign all of my emails and all my kids' stuff. Eric McArdle of Simplify Asset Management. I'm a managing director there, and um, I basically help people understand what we do. I try and live up to our name, right, which is a challenge sometimes. Um, didn't really have a nickname. Uh, I guess I'd go with intern, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Blake Dinger, Spider Rock Advisors. I'm a portfolio manager uh, for our SMA business. I did not have the distinction of being on the floor, and I don't know that I have any appropriate nickname that I could, I could say. <laughs> uh, in terms of, we'll, we'll jump in. We had, we had talked about this, but 
what are the new innovative use cases that you're seeing on the buy side? Um, and, you know, and, you know, why are you, why do you think they're, they're emerging? I can take that. I, you know, for us, it's been, um, I think a, a grinding road, which has led to customization in an SMA format for largely retail, private wealth, um, some institution family offices. And so it, rather than it being a singular product, I think it's, it's been the push to um, sort of want to optimize for, you know, after tax net worth in this customized manner and the delivery varies, you know, for every client. Eric? Yeah, I mean, the options-based ETF industry has exploded the past couple of years, right? And, um, you know, I think a lot of that is driven by demand for products that speak to some type of behavioral preference, right? So whether it's, you know, risk aversion or loss aversion, income, obviously very popular. And then uh, occasionally you'll get something kind of exotic that comes out. And, um, you know, I think most of the growth is obviously just driven by client demand, right? So as long as there are the right ways to express a thesis or build some type of portfolio, somebody out there will be creative enough to put things together and test the market for it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we don't have any uh, clients as a uh, proprietary market maker, but we're seeing the growth right on our end because we're providing liquidity uh, as these option structures grow. And I think what's exciting for us is as, you know, as options market makers, we like pricing vault. That's what we really want to do all day and do it well and uh, be able to provide liquidity in that way. And, and while, and we're definitely going to talk about it, you know, the world is focused on, on zero DTEs, you also have this growth, this kind of quiet growth growing um, on the long dated curve and flex market, you know, in, in very specific ways in which we can create, you know, get creative and price volatility. Um, and there's growth on that end too, um, which is very exciting to see. We'll talk about the amount of resources that are being devoted to zero T DTE, but of these sort of, whether it's on the SMA side, longer dated options, how do you think the industry should refocus resources, right? So at some point, all of this growth that's happened over the last three years needs to be supported. Um, and so the, what, what initiatives do you think the industry should be doing to support some of this nascent growth? I think edu education, we, t we talked about this, you know, for us, our best clients are educated clients. And, and I'll cut you off a little bit. When you say education, obviously everyone here knows options, so let's say everyone here is well-educated. Sort of specifically, where in the ecosystem would you like to see the education the resources for education. Yeah, I, I, it seems to me, based on what I've heard here this morning, that there's a ton of, of time and effort that's being spent to educate the end retail client. Our client base being, again, financial advisors, as, you know, as you'd think of them, making sure that that crew who is going to then go talk to a, you know, a potential end client uh, understands exactly what they're getting into and why they might use an instrument uh, to me is the, you know, the best use of, of time and, and effort right now is this, I think, industry and product and all these products are you know, still in their nascency. What are you guys' thoughts on the education topic? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, everybody always comes up here and says education, 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 right? And it, it's, um, you know, the implication is that we need to educate the end client. I, I have kind of a different view on that. I think that um, social proof and the growth of a space is often enough for a client to basically look beyond the sausage making and say, all right, I, I see you know, $100 billion in this or $150 billion in this space. I know my neighbor using it. I know another advisor using this, et cetera. I feel much more comfortable as long as you don't screw me, right? And everybody is you know, vested in making sure that the end client gets a good experience, right? Otherwise, you know, the revenue stops. So I would actually say that from an industry perspective, educating asset managers who aren't using options is probably a huge opportunity for you because, you know, as you've seen in the last couple of years, you do have some legacy asset managers that are running strategies, right, and doing very well. 
you have some startups like us that are coming in and trying to you know, carve out a name for ourselves, but there's a ton of other asset managers that just have never touched options at all, right? And now that we're in this stage in the industry where you know, the adoption is, is there, I think you can go back to these old legacy asset managers and say, hey, you should be considering this, right? You should think about how you can build you know, structured trades or some type of um, you know, defined outcome or income product, and we will help you do that. Any thoughts on that, Megan, or the same? No, I mean, I just think it's, it's definitely, I agree with both of you. I think it is a combination of both. You know, I can remember from my um, Eurex days going around to pension funds, um, you know, around the U.S. and just trying to talk through um, new products and new strategies. And, of course, you know, while they were keen to allocate um, more money um, to that, the product or the strategy that we were talking about, you know, one of the, one of the comments was, we would get often, it's like, I would love to do this, but my board is a bunch of retired teachers. I can't explain it to them. And they're like, I am literally just sitting down and whiteboarding out, this is a call, and this is a put, and this is a way. And I, I think what's exciting is we seem to be beyond that now. Uh, our state uh, you know, of the industry is these teachers and, and firefighters, and you know, when they're going to their board, they can explain. You know, there's at least a basis of education there now around options to the point where you can now explain these structures to some degree. Yep. Can I add something on that yeah. too? And, and I think um, you know, if you draw parallels to other deliveries or exposures in the space, um, you know, just asset management broadly, many clients don't know what an index is. Many clients don't know what a bond is or like how it works, right? So there's kind of this, I agree with you that you know, once you kind of get out there and you know, people look at the delivery and they look at the experience and you know, the income or whatever that's hitting their account or their statement every month, they kind of say, somebody smarter than me has probably vetted this and I trust it. Right. And of course, that's dangerous. Right. Like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. You don't want to just rely upon, you know, the herd all the time. But again, I think the incentives are there where, you know, a failed product isn't good for anybody. Right. Everyone's talking. Let's sort of what we're not saying it feels like is what is the risk from your side to the growth that we've seen over the last three years? Right. So. Obviously, we should do education because that, that helps, but that probably helps with growth. But as you think about your time, what are you, what are you afraid of in terms of the disrupts, this sort of growth and the hockey stick that we've seen over the last couple of years? Do you have any, yeah. I think empirically for us um, in learning about this, the private wealth space is that there's a ton of inertia to get these guys to do anything. Right, especially you know, it's hey, we've got a, an asset allocation. You know, you're going to buy U.S. equities. You're going to buy 20% of bonds. Whatever you know, whatever it might be, and we're done. That's tried and true. That's a, approved by my IC. I can't get in trouble for that. To take somebody out of a linear payout space and say, okay, now we're going to add we're going to add options to this portfolio. The the juice has got to be worth the squeeze for them. And if, if they aren't educated, right, if they don't set expectations correctly up front, then I think where we'll find ourselves is in a place where, you know, there's enough anecdotal experience and evidence for people to say, I, I've heard, you know, that guy had a bad experience implementing this type of strategy. Why would I take that risk? It's just not worth me introducing to my clients. Well, let me, let me, so... So in our in, in fixed income, you had a point where CDS was massive. It was it, it it outgrew the actual cash market by a multitude, and then defaults happened, and people realized that this is problematic. I'm not saying that this is the situation, but what do you think turns the 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 current asset managers that have the strategy, the ones that are using it? What what do you think could happen? And then the next question is, how do we prevent that? for them to go back, to backtrack? How do people, you know? Yeah, I think, I still think it's, it's expectation. Of, for us, the best example, I think, you know, talking about income, 
so many people still approach something like call selling as this black box that is just going to magically create some money. And, you know, we can, we can just bang on the table and, until we can't say anything anymore. And they still, you know, okay, cool. I'll take my dividend now. Yeah. And so setting expectations up front, like if we have enough people who have, you know, bad experiences with, you know, I expected this magical thing to occur, it didn't, and, you know, for better or for worse, no one told me up front. I, I think that's the, you know, I don't know that it's like this discrete event, but enough of that happens and, and things will, will slow down. You guys, what do you guys think? What, how do you... Who here has gotten their butt kicked on an option trade before? Right, and we learn from it, and you keep going. Um, you know, in, in a butt kicking, uh, you know, to be PC, um, that can come in many shapes and forms, right? Sometimes it can be a, a real mild thumping, and um, you know that that is really just underperforming some type of benchmark, right? So when you you have a yield strategy, uh, obviously something very popular in the market today. You know, for some folks, they don't even really care. In my you know, experience, they don't really care if they're even underperforming, right? Because what they like is the certainty. They like maybe a lower volatility total return profile in general. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that um, as people buy these types of things and adopt these types of exposures, some will come to realize, oh, this wasn't the free lunch I thought it was, right? And that's okay. But I think many will also look back and say, but it worked for me and it kept me invested, right? And I think that, that is, that's a goal that we don't talk about enough. Um, and I, I think, you know, honestly, just again, the growth of these products and the stickiness of the assets, that's a testament to that, right? The people, they like the outcomes, they like the experience of the hold, they like getting their returns you know, delivered to them in a different way. Um, and that might be enough. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, once again, we don't have investors. Um, we're not out there talk, actively talking to to investors. But um, you know, as a market maker, we're very um, we're very we we just understand that we have to create a market that is good for the end investor. Otherwise, you know, the music's just going to stop, right? For all of us, and um, you know, we are actively working with. You know, with, with new products, with the exchanges, with the, you know, any, as liquidity providers, making sure, you know, not designing something that's best for us, but is best for the end customer, because that will ultimately benefit us, right? So um, that's kind of the approach that we take and really want to make sure that, you know, we're not um, growing the market for growth. We're, you know, helping grow the market to be sustainable over time. Now the big question, the zero DTE, I mean, I, you just can't avoid it. So everyone has to talk about it. <laughs> I won't even ask the question. Just say what you'd like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we, it's funny, for all the talk I hear about it, we, don't, we really don't have or find clients coming in on the regular to us to say, you know, I, you know, e even for education purposes, let alone I want to do something in the space, we don't offer anything in the space. Like our book is pretty plain vanilla, you know, we're uh, short call, long put. And so you start to run into tax issues with even selling calls, you know, that, that shortened time. I, I frankly compare it to just walking into the casino, if I'm, if I'm being on it. Like there's no, there's no vol trade to it. Um, I know there's a ton of interest, but we, you know, we haven't, it's, it's sort of, you know, uh, someone said yesterday, like even the market makers have their own groups for it. It seems to be siloed off and just not, you know, as much as I'd like to think we're everywhere in the space, we haven't seen or heard a, you know, a ton of direct interest in it. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's this sentiment that there's a retail trader somewhere, you know, dumping a million dollars on a zero DT option and doing it over and over, right? And I'm sure there are people out there doing it. I mean, I've talked to a few, um, you know, and, and obviously that can end really poorly. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in like the 40 act space or in just, again, the product development and delivery, we don't really see a demand for that type of exposure. Um, now, there are some new products in the ETF wrapper that, that focus on zero DT vol selling or, you know, position selling. And, um, 
We'll see how they do. I mean, I think they're, they're fairly new. Um, people chase yield, right? So if you spit out high distribution figures and you don't blow up, I'm sure there will be a market for that. But of course, we know that one day it will blow up. And then the question becomes, you know, from an industry perspective, was enough done to protect the little guy? And I don't know how you answer that. I think, I think you will have to go through some type of experience where, you know, something that is publicly traded or on exchange has a really crappy day and the press makes a, you know, a week of it. Uh, and then a, a regulator or, you know, a congressperson who's looking to get their time on the news is going to go talk about it too. But I don't know what comes after that. So it almost feels inevitable to me. Megan, you talked about the resources being devoted to this. So. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, it's, it's a big part of our market, right? It's a big part of the volume, um, and it's gro it keeps growing. Um, so we as liquidi liquidity providers want to be there. Um, again, you know, I think what happens is, is it, it does take a lot of resources. It's a lot of market data. Um, it's a lot of tech build, um, and so it does, you know, suck out a lot of the oxygen in the room where, you know, there is other, like I just said, there's other exciting opportunities um, in this ETF space that I think will, could just drive innovation in the market in a, in a kind of balancing out the other side of the of the curve, right, of the term structure, um, which is pretty exciting. And we hope that there's not opportunity cost by focusing on zero DTs. It's on the top of mind of like, and just as you said, you know, we talk about this a lot in industry groups is where, where is the line? You know, where do we say this product, all right, now it's time to stop listing zero DTs on, on which products and exactly what you said, like the biggest focus is the headline risk of like, you don't want to stop the momentum that is the retail investor getting into the options. It's such a great opportunity for this market. I was at a event two months ago um, and someone was saying that they think, you know, 40 million contracts a day in the OCC could easily be 100 million, easily, from their perspective. And this was someone involved in the retail space. So there's a lot of momentum, and you just don't want something happening that takes us back, that, that forces the regulators to take us back years. Look, unintended consequences of some blow up. I think there's a ton of markets where regulators step in and overshoot and don't think through the full ramifications, and then three years later, you're like, this is kind of the end result of, of something that was meant to protect people. In terms of, like, vision, and, and you, you probably led us in the right place, 40 million contracts or 44 going to 100. Where is the industry in five years from your side? Uh, I think in terms of probably, like, our two products, and you'll have your own opinion, I think we keep like this is so nascent in terms of of outreach on these type of offerings. Investors, you know, from from our perspective, largely have they know what an option is, and yes, they've seen, you know, this or that education piece online or whatever. But there's still so much education to be done, and there is after a, you know for us in particular after just a rampant bull market, the amount of you know taxable dollars that we see that are over-risked versus an asset allocation with no real tool to address it. Yes, I'm talking our book. Um, like, it, it's just, it's kind of mind-boggling. So it's, you know, where are we in, in five years? I would have been... 200, uh, two, 200. Yeah, I, like 200 I... 200 million contracts. I, I totally think that's possible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in our space, you know, J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, Right, they're all hitching their wagons to these exposures because they're higher margin. Right, they're what the clients want. Um, I think we will, you know, the distribution right now for for ETFs, um, especially for newer issuers, is very very competitive. Right, so you're you're competing for um, 
you know, limited attention, and, and it's, it's just a, it's a very tough space to distribute in, right? And so I think as you continue to see growth here, and I think the momentum is there, you'll then go from, okay, this is a product or an exposure that, say, you know, a sophisticated RIA would buy, to now a, you know, home office, a model strategist, putting these types of things in and giving them to the entire firm, right? As opposed to, you know, having a few sophisticated RIAs that are willing to buy and, and use this stuff, I think you'll see more of it in models. Um, and part of that will be from rev share agreements that you know, the, the asset managers have with the platforms. Part of it will just be from client demand. People like getting paid, right? And so if you can take a portfolio yield on a 60-40 and effectively increase that you know, by 100 to 150 basis points with a very similar you know, risk and profile, I think there will be a demand for that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're talking about that, you know, when I was talking about that 40 to 100 million, right? That is someone talking from a um, retailer opening up accounts point of view of, um, you know, individuals just trading options on their own. But what, again, I go back to, and I'm a, I, I am a one-trick pony on this panel, is the market that these guys are creating, the ETF wrapper, you know, options wrapper in an ETF, the, the overlay strategies, all of these interesting investment opportunities that rely on options um, to uh, hedge their, their exposure is going to drive that other growth of the, of the options market, which, you know, we need, which is super exciting. And, you know, my aha moment, when I was at Eurex, I was um, in charge of growing the V-Stocks market. So I studied the VIX market backwards and forwards, and um, people joked that my kids would talk about V-Stocks at dinner. Um, and what I, what we always said at Eurex, you know, hot, markets don't grow in straight lines. Markets grow in hockey sticks, right? And you get one trader, two traders, eight traders, a thousand. And it's about getting to that inflection point. And with the VIX, if you look, the moment the VXX and the XIV started to get AUM, huge amounts of AUM, the futures got liquid. And once the futures got liquid, the options got liquid. And then all of a sudden, you know, in 2015, everyone is in the market, is trading the VIX, right? But the catalyst was that ETF, you know, those ETFs drove the growth in that market. And that's what's exciting about these products that you guys are creating and the strategies that you're creating because it is going to bring a new influx of liquidity into the options market that we can all build, uh, we can all build on. Can, can I ask something? Yeah. And, and you know, maybe we're gonna go here, but um, one of the things that we struggle with is, again, I alluded to this earlier, is distribution, right? So when distribution takes off, everybody benefits, right? Hopefully. Um, I think the industry could do more to help smaller, I mean, again, I'm up here, hat in my hand, but um, the industry could do more to help smaller issuers or innovative issuers, they could be large issuers, um, get in front of clients, right? Because when the client then buys into this, everybody benefits, right? And so the distribution um, on our side uh, again, it's just getting more and more competitive, more pay to play, right? You're seeing rev share agreements put in for ETFs, which is a fairly new development. Um, had we launched our business right now, as opposed to about four years ago, uh, it would be a much more challenging environment to grow in, right? For a, a number of reasons, right? Cost of capital, distribution, et cetera. So if we want more innovation in the space, if we want a dynamic ecosystem, of new issuers and new strategies, right, in market, I think we all, ourselves included, right, we have to kind of think of this as, you know, growing the pie together, and that starts on the distribution side, in my opinion. It's all storytelling. So I, what you're saying is, look, I, I, I've always, you know, people, my, my son asks me, like, what I do for a living, and I go, I run a team of nerds, right? Because, like, <laughs> like, 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 and, and I, I, I ask people over time, like, like, why did I do options? And I said, you know, look, I did it because no one wants my job, right? Like, no, like, like, I came with a bunch of kids and they wanted to do equities and they wanted to sell bonds. And like, there was like, I remember it was a 
couple of mathematicians and some physicists sitting in this corner doing derivatives, and they were like, yeah, that doesn't seem sexy at all, right? And so I think what we're talking about, the, the thematic here is that it, it feels like it needs to be more accessible. You need kids coming out of school, you need people in the industry saying options are a real path forward, right? I love everyone here, but it feels like everyone knows everyone, and Everyone's been at different firms over time, but, like, but we need to expand the ecosystem of the professionals. If that's what I'm hearing from everyone, is that if, if there was a kid coming out or someone in the industry that said, look, I just want to do options, and this is like my, my path, my career, I think is, would be helpful in creating more. It's, it's a fragmented market, right? The, the RIA market is extremely fragmented. The money management market is extremely fragmented. And, you're trying to change that. Um, we have more questions, but I'll pause here and see if there's any questions in, in the audience. I hear, do we have one in the front? Here we go. So um, based on what you're saying, like what, what are the most frequent types of new clients you're seeing coming in? So for everyone, it's, it's Based on what they're seeing in the market, what are the new sort of marginal client coming into the market? Where are they from? How are you sourcing them? Go for it. Uh, from our, it's, it's kind of what I said. It's client generically with an equity portfolio that is just so over-risked versus an IPS over the last you know, 10 years. How do we, how, how do we address this right from, a, from an advisor? We have no tools or no sufficient tools right now to, to do a whole lot of anything with this. So I'd say you know, probably 40% of our business is directly addressing things like concentrated stocks. So just, I mean, MAG7 right now is the perfect example of, you know, hey, I have, I have this security that all of a sudden makes up 80% of my net worth. I'm 90% allocated to equities. And I'm 75 years old. You know, what, how do I? What do I do? Um, and so that's you know that's what we're designing. And I don't want to. And I don't want to pay the taxes. Yeah. Ex <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> let, let's let, let's set the other part, the, right? Like, that's the key like, part. Like, 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 like it's 90% of my portfolio, and I don't want to pay the taxes. So yeah. what should I do? Right? Yep. Like, yeah. We we see about 70% of our flows from RIAs. And so these tend to be you know, more sophisticated, generally, a little bit more entrepreneurial, more willing to try newer products. Um, How do you guys find them? <laughs> we just annoy them to death. <laughs> no. Um, no, and we talked about this a little bit backstage. I mean, I, I think that one of the challenges with um, these types of exposures is you, know, you have to start with the lowest common denominator from a marketing perspective. Right, so what do people understand? What does your grandmother understand? Yield, downside protection, right? So speaking to them about the benefits, uh, sometimes that's you know, even just performance, right? And really focusing on performance marketing when we can, um, that drives business, right? Um, so I mean, that, that's important. You need to kind of put that out there. You don't want to do it in a way where it is optimizing for the yield, for example, right? Because that's a very dangerous thing. We know that yield is not total return. A lot of investors believe that, unfortunately. Um, but again, it goes back to the, the mistake that they'll make eventually, and they'll figure it out, and they'll decide, okay, is this worth it or not? Um, the other thing, I mean, retail is a big part of the business, but we are increasingly focusing on institutional clients to get them to look at the ETF wrapper and say, Okay, if at the, you know, the right price with you know, daily liquidity, et cetera, this is a compelling offering for us. We don't have to have you know, three, four, five people or consultants on our internal teams handling this type of allocation, right? And we can do more and more using um, listed options. We do a lot in the you know, OTC market. We do futures, right? So um, that, I think, is a huge opportunity from an institutional perspective to get assets over into you know, public-facing products. Where are you seeing it? We don't, <laughs> have, we don't so, have So let me ask you a question. This is, this is interesting as, you, as we're talking about the market. Social media. Like what's, what's the view here in helping, you know, helping the product, helping distribution, helping familiarity? What's, have you guys, have you, are you guys actively 
at your firms using social media at all, and how? We're very active, very active. What do you do on social media? Um, Hopefully not like again, maybe maybe photos. too active, right? I don't want to. <laughs> I don't know. What to do. You know, but uh, cat uh, photos with Delta meetings. and Vega. I, there are <laughs> there are issuers that do some pretty funny stuff. Um, I'll put a name out. Direction. They have a really interesting marketing team. So go check out their social feed. But um, you know, thinking about how the media landscape has changed in the last you know five years, we feel that it is a great time to basically disrupt how you market, right? And so going to the consumer directly via LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, or whatever we call it now, um, being very intentional about using like search marketing, right? So thinking about how might somebody, somebody wants something, right? How might they search for it? I want income, I want monthly income, I want low vol monthly income, I want it in an ETF. Okay, great, you go search for that, we're gonna be there, All right? So we are, hyper-focused on constantly refining that type of, you know, what we call performance advertising. And um, again, if you do it the right way, if you do it on YouTube, for example, this is actually a great one. If you go to YouTube and type covered call or options-based income strategy, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of independent creators that, you know, Joe Income or Dividend Snowball or whatever, and these folks have 20, 30, 40,000 subscribers. And you go, okay, I can advertise on top of this person's channel for three cents a view. That's a lot more effective than going to, you know, no offense, you know, I won't say any names, but like legacy media, right? Going and buying a commercial spot or, you know, producing it, paying for airtime. So you can be very progressive in how you market, and that's how you get new clients, right? And, you know, the, uh, the GameStop stock, of course, like, you know, I won't relitigate that, but um, that type of event draws eyeballs. Right? And so then you just have to think, okay, where are those eyeballs looking? And how can I get our message behind it? Or how can I ride this narrative or, or help reshape a new one? So what I hear you say, I'm always going to rephrase. We need, like, cauliflower. We need a marketing team like cauliflower. Like, you eat cauliflower? They, they, cauliflower am I the yeah. only one that's a oh, victim yeah. of, like, yeah, cauliflower I, rice? Yeah, like, cauliflower like, Am I pizza? the only, like, yeah. I don't know when cauliflower rice became a thing, but... <laughs> Whatever that marketing team did, we Amazing. need to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's our, you, 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 you don't use it at all. I'm, I'm personally aware of, like, the, you know, vol Twitter and, and all of the people on there. If I pretend for a second or portray that I'm a part of our marketing team, I'm going to have four or five emails as soon as I get <laughs> off the stage. Uh, but I, I think... Suffice it to say, we're aware of like other mediums of distribution, um, and, and our use of them, I think, is is still you know, it's a little bit of like feel things out. But like LinkedIn is an obvious one that I you know I know we utilize. Yeah. I, it, suffice it to say, you you have to look at things other than oh I'm going to go you know buy some some space in in today's Wall Street Journal type. Like it, there buy has to be billboards? something else. Yeah. Buy a billboard. Yeah, yeah. And, and to that point though, I mean, you mentioned Vault Twitter, right? And I mean. I've learned so much on Twitter. Um, and, you know, I tell my wife that so she knows that you know, I have an excuse for being on the app all the time. But, um, but thinking about partnering with independent you know, thought leaders on Twitter or on Substack, right? This is a, a new way to distribute. And oftentimes you get you know, some of the smartest people in the world going out and doing things independently, right? And if you can support them in any way, whether it's you know, directly advertising with them or finding ways to empower them and, and, you know, bring them on panels or bring them in front of other investors, right? It's all, you can reciprocate. And I mean, I think that's, again, it goes back to this growth mindset that we have to really, you know, constantly remind ourselves of and not get in a, a position of saying like, yeah, Spider Rock's a competitor. We don't want to do business with them, right? Like, we're, there's room for us all to grow and benefit. Before we close out, is there anything I, I didn't touch on that... Anything that we you'd like to, to add, and and again, I'll open it up to the floor for for questions. Um, now you guys, you guys have said everything. You guys feel everything is off your chest. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I want to thank everyone um, for 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 listening. Uh, you know, we're we're about near the the end of time, and want to appreciate. I think you know, look, my takeaway from from talking to the three professionals here is that. As an organization, as as an industry, and as a as a group, um, 
we need boots on the ground talking to a consumer base that is highly fragmented. It feels like the concentrated portion of the market, the big institutions have consolidated, and so they're bringing in and will have the ability, but the next step is, you know, I think about the market, and there's a huge push now between the, the person that has a, between a million and five million has now become a massive target over the next 10 to 15 years, and the question is, what is the penetration of option usage for the person who has between a million and five million dollars? And, and that's where Fidelity is putting their time, that's where BlackRock's putting time, that's where Schwab, everyone is putting time into this group. And it, it, the takeaways for me has been, you know, without a good education plan, without really good innovative products, probably a less, it doesn't seem like this group has, that group has a demand for zero DTE. Um, but if we can find a way to get that group, maybe we get to 40 to 100. So thank you to everyone. Um, and I appreciate uh, the time. Take care. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.